Good morning, everyone. I want to ask that, um, I know you just got comfortable, but I want to ask that you would stand for uh, the call to worship, if you are able. Uh, Our call to worship comes from Psalm 43. It is verses 3 and 4. Hear the call to worship. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with a lyre, O God, my God. This morning you're going to hear a a bit of a theme of light even throughout our psalm selection, and that theme is rooted in our sermon text. The Apostle John refers to Jesus as the true light in chapter 1 of his gospel And in our call to worship this morning, the psalmist prays, send out your light and your truth. And the Father sent his only Son. Jesus is that light and truth. Let's come before our great God and sing Psalm 43, Selection A. Psalm 43A. pray. Lord, just thank you for that we can sing psalms, that that's a big way in which we can just speak to you, we can hear your heart, we can feel your emotions, we can share ours, and we just thank you for that privilege. And now as we would come to worship you today, we just ask we do so in the spirit, and we just thank you and ask you to draw near to you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Um, some of you know that um, Psalm 17a is our Psalm of the Month. Um, I know Jonathan knows that. I, I think others do too. Um, but it, it, the, the, here's an idea. This is a good Psalm to lead off with today. I would recommend it if, if you kind of have a morning time with the Lord, maybe a Bible study or you get up early or in the evening. If you can't think of anything else to do, just sing this Psalm once because it, there's something about it that um, it's a good way to start off worship to do. He really wants, I, I get the sense I'm, as I work through it, the psalmist really wants to come to church today. Uh, he's got this longing to be with the Lord. He's um, kind of aggressive and calling on, on God and saying, you know, I really, I want to be with you. I'm here. Um, I want to talk to you. I want to praise you. I want to um, worship you. I want to I hear what you have to say to me. And I have some things I would like to express to you. Stanza one, he's um, 
th this is where he encourages us to be very forthright or bold in our prayers, really express how we feel. Um, this is one way he says it in the first stanza. Oh, listen to my cry, give your attention to my prayer. And then in stanza two, it seems like he might have gotten woken up in the night, perhaps, but um, he's going through some self-examination. He's asking the Lord, I need guidance, I need help. Um, it seems like he's had his time with the Lord in some way or another. And this is how we'll sing it. You came by night and tested me. You searched my heart within. And then he also, in the same uh, stanza there, he noted, you can notice how God's word can be helpful in restraining our natural bent towards sin. Whether it's uh, Bible study, memorizing, meditating, reading, singing, hearing God's word preached, re reading good commentaries, you're, it's a great investment. Some of you, I don't know how many of you like to, I don't know if anybody likes to play the stock market, probably one, a couple of people do here, but if you're, we all think in terms of investments, if not financial, other kinds of investments of time and all that. And in this case, you, you don't, this is always gonna be a good investment, good return. And here's how, how we'll sing it. My foot I've kept upon your path, and so it never slips. And then stanza three, he gets emotional when he's praying. He, he doesn't hold back in making his request known. Now, in the Hebrew, Andrew, I'm pretty, you can correct me, but I'm pretty sure there's no exclamation points in Hebrew. But whoever the translators are, they put a whole bunch of exclamation points in here because he's, he's getting pretty, out, he's really saying, Lord, you've got to hear me. And so for us to be able to pray this way, it's, we're, we're getting that permission, you might say here, to really pour our hearts out. Oh, listen to my earnest words. Incline your ear to me. But then at the very end, he ends with a real note of hope and gives us a promise that we can claim. And in this, you don't, in other translations, it'll say, God is our refuge, which is known to many of you. The way we sing it here is, your right hand saves those trusting you to hide them from the foe. So let's go ahead and claim these promises as we sing Psalm 17a and to lead us into our worship of the Lord today. Um, so whoever, uh, yes, come ahead, let's go ahead and sing.
be seated. Well, we've come uh, now to our time of corporate prayer, where uh, we'll bring um, some of the things that God has brought up providentially in the life of the church. We'll pray through some of the items that you'll find in your bulletin, and then hopefully you've had a chance to look at some of the things that you see mentioned in news and views. So we'll pray uh, through some of those more personal items as well, and bring them to our great God who has the power uh, to help and to save. Let's bow uh, before our God in prayer. Lord, we want to recognize that it is a great privilege that we have to be able to come before you in prayer. We're so grateful that you are merciful and that you've saved us and that you've drawn us close, that you've given us the great privilege to come before you and pour out our hearts before you, to set before your throne our cares, our concerns, our, our fears, and our tears. Lord, we, we want to confess to you uh, that we are a broken people. Lord, we demonstrate that to you daily. Uh, though we want to turn from sin and follow you, Lord, you know how we struggle. We ask that you would forgive us. And Lord, we pray that you would change us. Would you do a work in our heart, Lord, that we would hate sin, that we would despise it even like you despise it, and that we would long to follow Jesus. Lord, would you show us the path and help us to walk in righteousness? Lord, we are grateful. You've given us so many things to be thankful for. And Lord, one of the things you've given us, again, is this great privilege to come to you in prayer and to come as your children. Lord, some of the things that you've given us to pray for are high and lofty things. We struggle to know how to pray. We are told in your word that we ought to pray for those who govern us, and so we would lift up the Indiana legislature to you. Lord, you know that they have been dealing with a monumental matter before this nation, uh, the sin of abortion, even the right to terminate a child in the womb. Lord, your word speaks of this we would ask that you would forgive us this grievous sin. And Lord, we do pray that you would change the hearts of our people. Lord, we'd ask that you would do a work in the heart of this nation. But we would pray for our legislature and we would ask that you would strengthen them. We pray that you would encourage them. We know that the work that they have done in recent days has been hard and that they have been under much pressure. Lord, we ask that your hand would be upon them, that you would make your law, which is written on their heart, even scream into their ears that they would hear it clearly. And we pray that you would give them all the strength that they would need, that they would walk in sync with your word. Lord, encourage them. Lord, we want to thank you that you have given us the opportunity to publish books with Crown and Covenant Publication. We'd ask uh, that you would help those who are stewarding this ministry to be faithful in their management of it. Lord, would you continue to provide for it and help them to, to do a good work, to publish books that would stir the hearts of your people uh, to affection for their Savior. Lord, we want to lift up the Marian RPC Church to you. We would lift them to you and ask that you would continue to have your hand of blessing upon them. We would ask that you would keep them unified. We pray that you would give them direction. We thank you for putting it upon their heart to give a call to Aaron and Mary Murray. And so we would lift them up to you this morning and... Uh, we are rejoicing to hear that they intend to take that call. Lord, we pray that you would prepare the congregation and Aaron and Mary, even their children. Lord, we pray you would have your hand on this situation, uh, that your church would thrive and grow. 
Lord, we're thankful for ministries within our own city. We think of Jesus' house and the work that's being done there. Lord, we'd ask that you would encourage the leadership there, uh, that you would continue to bring men to this house, and that you would continue to do a work of discipleship there. We want to pray for the children of our congregation. Lord, you know it is our desire that all of them will have saving faith, that they will walk with you all the days of their life, that they will live lives that honor you. And so we would pray to that end. Lord, would you raise up, even amongst us uh, who are adults, people who would pour into their lives. Lord, would you help us to uh, teach them, instruct them, point them to your gospel. Uh, Would you help us to be faithful? We want to lift up our session and deacon meeting coming up this week too. We would ask that you would have your hand heavy upon our leaders, that you would guide them, that you would help them to be faithful in that calling which you have called them to. We pray that you would keep them unified. We pray that you would give them wisdom. Um, We pray that you would give them love for one another. And most of all, Lord, we pray that you would give them a deep love for your church. Lord, you know that there are many grieving families amongst us. We would lift up the Bibby, the Charbonneau, the Thompson, and even my own family. Lord, you know that we have all experienced death in these last couple weeks. And so we would ask that you would have your hands upon these grieving families. We thank you so much for the support you have given. We pray that you would raise up people who would come around, those who are grieving, that they would grieve with them, and that they uh, would point them to the great promises of your word. We thank you for our sister Joy Falk and how you have heard our prayers. Lord, you know how our hearts were shaken when we heard that she had cancer. Uh, So we we are so thankful that uh, You had your hand upon her surgery and that they were able to remove that. Lord, we would ask that your hand would be with her doctors, that they would care for her, that they would have great insight and discernment, um, and that you would bless her through them. Lord, we're grateful too for the Nelson's grandson, Wade Fisher, that his uh, cleft palate surgery went well. We would give you thanks for that. Lord, we'd ask that you would help him as he continues to recover from, from that surgery. Lord, you know that we um, have cause for rejoicing, great rejoicing, and that you are um, putting two new families together. And so we want to lift up Alice Yu and Daniel Carr. We want to lift up Nirma Rao and Aaron Dinkeldine. Lord, we pray that you would take these two couples and that you would continue to do a work in their hearts. We pray that you would prepare them for marriage. And Lord, as they come together, we pray that you would knit their hearts together We pray that these two households would be a beacon of light and that they would point uh, to your gospel, the love of Christ for his church and the love of the church for her Savior. Lord, we would lift up uh, Dr. Watt, Jonathan Watt, and we would ask that your hand would be on him as he travels to Liberia. Lord, you have placed in the heart of this congregation a certain desire, a certain love, a certain uh, vision for ministering to this great nation. And we pray that you would continue to strengthen us for that work and that you would be, help us to be faithful in that work. And we do pray for Jonathan that you would have your hand upon him as he travels there and as he travels home. Lord, our understanding is that he will be ministering to, instructing, and teaching other pastors there. We pray that you would use him for that work. We also want to lift up the B family to you. Lord, we're grateful that you have made us a sending church, and yet, Lord, you know that there is some pain in being a sending church because we love those that we send, and we're so far away And oftentimes, we don't see one another for years. We think of the B family, and and we'd lift them to you. We'd ask that your hand would be upon them, that you would continue to provide for them. Lord, we pray that you would encourage them, 
that um, you would uh, raise up amongst us and continue to provide us with a longing to stay in contact, that they would know that they are cared for, prayed for, and loved. We pray for the new baby that is in, within the womb. We pray that you would have your hand upon uh, this child and that the birth would be uh, without incident, that uh, you would bring the baby uh, safely into this world. We pray for their families as they travel there to minister and to be a comfort to them. Lord, we'd also lift up the New Graha congregation in India, and we are grateful and would give you praise for the new intern that you have given them. Lord, we would ask that you would give this intern clarity as he um, seeks to exercise the gifts that you've given him and as he seeks to minister to your church, Lord, would you help him to see where he belongs in service to your church? And would you use his gifts to be a blessing to your church? We'd ask that you would give the elders of the Anugraha congregation wisdom too as they reflect on this man, that they would know how to best come alongside him and help him in the service of your church and in the advancement of your gospel. Lord, we've brought many things before you on a wide variety of topics. We are so frail, so small. We realize that you have all wisdom and need no instruction from, from us. And so therefore, Lord, we would ask that in all these things, you would do all of your holy will and that you would help us to be full of joy and praise as we watch your will unfold before our eyes. We'd ask that you would hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, we're going to prepare our hearts for the public reading and preaching of God's word by singing Psalm 27, Selection A. And in Psalm 27, David is confident that the Lord will deliver him. And he desires to go to God's house where he will be reminded of the Lord's goodness to his people. You'll notice that in the first verse, David says, the Lord is his light, his salvation, and the stronghold of his life. I'd ask that you would please stand and we'll come before the Lord singing Psalm 27a, Psalm 27, Selection A. morning. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3. We return again to the book of John after a bit of a hiatus 
Uh, We come to the third chapter once again, and if you uh, have been with us, you know that we've reflected on Jesus, uh, uh, John rather, the Apostle John who's writing his uh, reason for writing. He says at the end of the book that uh, uh, these things are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you might have life in his name. And chapter three uh, tells us all about who Jesus is. It tells us about what it means to believe and what this eternal life is like. And we're going to see that especially here in verses 16 through 21 today. I'm going to read uh, everything from verse 1 down through chapter 21. But again, we'll be focusing on verses 16 through 21. And uh, you might uh, note in your Bible, if you have one that's a red letter edition, a lot of uh, Bibles will have uh, these words in red. Uh, Scholars debate whether these are the words of Jesus that he continues to speak to Nicodemus, uh, or whether these are the words of the Apostle John as he's reflecting on things later. And uh, I would simply say to you, I don't know uh, which category these words fall into. I tend to think that it's probably most likely that these are John's reflections later. But in one sense, it doesn't really matter because uh, all scripture is breathed out by God. It's given by inspiration of God. These are the words of Christ. So whether it's words that he spoke to Nicodemus or whether these are words that he worked by the power of his spirit in the Apostle John, it's all true. And so as we come uh, to this word today, we come to a supernatural revelation from God, uh, Jesus revealing himself to us. Uh, These words being breathed out uh, by the Spirit of God, even uh, as they have been given to us. So we're going to pray, and then we'll read uh, verses 1 through 23 as we look to the Lord who has spoken to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have uh, loved us. We thank you that you've loved us so much that you want to communicate to us. And we pray now that you would give us ears to hear so that we might hear the voice of our good shepherd from heaven. We thank you that you've given your Holy Spirit so that these words might be breathed out for us to read today. And we thank you that uh, just as Jesus blew uh, on his disciples and gave and bestowed the Holy Spirit, we thank you that you give that same spirit to us today. So we ask that you, triune God, would communicate to your people this day so that we might know that you are our God and that we are your people. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This is God's word. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. 
But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Thus ends this reading of God's holy word. We pray that he would write it on our hearts today and forever. On a muggy summer day, something like this, when I was a teenager, I was baling hay and we were putting hay into the mow uh, as uh, others were working to see it gathered in the field. And uh, around dusk, we came out of the barn. We had to go out to the field to get uh, one more load. And we went, we got the wagons, and it took a little time. And as we came back, dusk had settled even more. And I began to climb up into the hay mow on the elevator or the conveyor belt on the outside. It wasn't running at this point, but I was uh, walking up that to go into the hay mow. And my friend uh, went into the barn to turn on the light for the first time because we hadn't needed the light to be on. And just as I came to the the small door that uh, went into the side of the barn, he flipped the light on and uh, all of a sudden I froze because hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bats saw one way out when the light had been flipped on, going right through the door and I could feel the wind uh, from their wings Uh, fluttering against my face and I was 12 feet in the air and there was nothing I could do to move backwards quickly enough. I was too high to jump. All I could do was hang on for dear life. And it only took a moment, but I, I still shake a little bit when I think about all of those bats flying right past my face. The only non-negative experience I had was there were no mosquitoes that I uh, faced at that particular moment. Everything else was horrendous about the whole experience. And you know what I learned in that moment? I learned that bats hate the light because they love the darkness instead. And it was a a rather terrifying moment and uh, I recovered and I'm still recovering from it. But you know, I've seen something that's even scarier through the course of life as the years have gone on. Over the last three decades, I've seen it's not only the bats that hate the light, but there there are people who hate the light as well. And their desire is to flee from the one who is the light, even the Lord Jesus Christ. They turn and they run because they're so obviously uncomfortable with the guilt of their own sin and their desire to live another way. And this passage is written to teach us and to show us what it is that God has done and to reveal to us that this Jesus of whom John writes, the one that he heard with his own ears, is the true light that has come into the world. And people sit in darkness apart from knowing him. And my desire today is to persuade you as these verses teach to come to the light, to come to the light. Whatever your station in life, today is a good day to come to the light of Jesus Christ. Verse 21 tells us that whoever does what is true comes to the light and we'll explore more of what this means as we move forward. But we need to come to the light, why? Well, it's because we're in darkness and it's because we're guilty. And Nicodemus was wrestling with these realities as Jesus was speaking to him. And we saw there in uh, verse 14 that uh, Jesus was lifted up just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness uh, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then there's this reflection that comes for us in verses 16 and following to tell us what this life looks like. What is it that this faith looks like that leads to life? And here, faith is particularly equated with coming to the light. Faith is seen, and it's demonstrated for us here as coming to the brightness of the one who is the light himself. And as we unpack this passage, uh, what is it that God shows us to persuade us to come, to lead us out of darkness and into light? Well, we're going to see, first of all, here in verses 16 and 17, what it is that God has done. And then secondly, in the following verses, we'll see that there are two responses to uh, Christ, to the light. But first of all, we need to understand if we're going to come to the light, what it is that God has done. Why is it that we should believe? 
And it's laid out so clearly for us here in, in, in what is undoubtedly the most famous verse in all of Scripture, maybe very dear to you in personal ways. And we're told of two things in particular that God has done for us here in verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world. God so loved the world. He, he loved people who were in darkness. He loved these even who had rebelled against him. R.C. Sproul says that maybe this is the most misunderstood verse in the Bible as well uh, with this idea that that God just uh, has has loved everyone without any exception at all so that, that all would be saved. We see in the following verses that that's simply not the case. But the emphasis here on the depth of God's love, as Sproul says, is that God, God's love is so deep and so profound that he sent his only begotten son. This is what motivates him to send his own son. It's the depth of the love that is in the heart of the triune God. He sees this world that is in need and in rebellion against him. And he sends his son on a rescue mission in order to draw people like you and me out of the gloom to pull us out of the hopelessness. The depth of his love is an amazing thing. We we see uh, his love uh, used or described mostly in chapters 13 through 17 in this book. And mostly there, the love that's spoken of is the love between the father and the son. We also see there the love that Jesus has for his disciples. But that's in the book of John, the bulk of the, the use of this term for love. But here in John 3.16, we see uh, simply the overflow from the heart of the triune God who declares to us that he has so loved the world that he would take this action to send his only son. And and what we see in this, in the depth of his love and the reality of, of darkness, is that it is not because God looked out there and said, you know, there are these lovely people that I would just long to get to know. No, it's in spite of our unloveliness. And it is because of the reality that God is love, as John communicates to us in John 4, 16. That is the reason. And we see this in the Old Testament as well, as God speaks to his people in Deuteronomy chapter 7. He he asks them uh, essentially, why do I love you? Well, it's not because you were more or greater or somehow more impressive, and the same is true for every single person here today. There's just nothing in you. Why does God love his people? Because God loves his people. In one sense, we will never know the depth of the answer to that question other than that God has revealed to us that he loves his people. So we're told here that God so loved uh, the world that he gave his only begotten son. We, we see the depth of it, and we also see that he, he so loved the world. And the, the impressive thing here is not that God looked and said, wow, it's a really big world. But it's that he looked and he said, it's a really bad world, as D.A. Carson says. What, what is so forceful about this verse and about the quality of God's love is the rebellion and the degradation and the sin and the corruption in people. But the holy God looked upon us and for his own purposes saw fit to save. And he knew it had to happen through the provision of a sacrifice. And so we see the second thing that he does here in this verse. It is that he gave his only son. He poured out his love on us, not simply by speaking words, not simply by giving us a few gestures of his kindness, but he did this by giving his own son. And in giving his own son, uh, we, we see that there was a, uh, a cost to this. He's coming into hostile territory. Some of you uh, may remember the story of the Navy SEAL, uh, Robert O'Neill, Uh, He was the man who uh, ended up being in the room with Osama bin Laden there in Pakistan and uh, was the man that put the bullet through his forehead. And uh, he, as a Navy SEAL, had been called on a number of dangerous missions over the years. And on this particular mission, those Navy SEALs knew that they would probably not make it home again. 
And as they uh, departed, they were able to look at each other in the eye with love and with compassion, but also with this profound sense that there's no way they were coming back. Well, you know the story. Uh, They did survive, and they all managed to get out alive, and there was great rejoicing. But they said that the reason, he said that the reason he was willing to do this, he was willing to put himself in the place of his fellow Americans to help take out this darkness that was in the world. This one who had perpetrated the attack on the United States in 9-11, he was willing to lay his life down so that the darkness might be snuffed out. But when God sent his only son into the world, it wasn't that he thought, well, maybe there's a a 10% chance that he survives. When Jesus agreed with the Father, it wasn't that he had the, the feeling that, well, we'll see how this goes. No, he knew that going to snuff out the darkness meant not going to condemn all of the people with darkened hearts in the world. Not to take a rifle to every person who was a sinner with his condemnation. But when God sent his only son into the world, it was so that Jesus might become the condemned. And that was known from the very outset that Jesus would die. And so you see the depth of the Father's love and that he was willing to give his own son so that we would not perish but have eternal life. What does it mean then that God did this, that he so loved the world that he would give his only son? Well, it meant that Jesus would go to the cross and that he would bear the wrath of God. You recall that the son was turned into darkness. It was blotted out as Jesus was there on the cross. The light of the world bore all of the darkness. He took on himself on that tree the wrath of God that was due to sinners so that whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish. He came as a substitute so that whoever would place their faith and their trust in him would not be condemned as he was. And of course, we know that his sacrifice was well-pleasing to the Father because on the third day, he was raised again. He was justified, and in him, we are justified as well. So that, again, whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. This is what your God has done for you. This is the light that has been sent into the world. And, And you see in verse 19, Uh, John reiterating this truth. He's summing up this statement. He says, this is the judgment that light has come into the world. You want to summarize Jesus' work? You want to summarize the love of God being poured out upon us? You want to summarize what it means that God sent his son? It means that light came into the world. And if you go back to John chapter 1, Uh, beginning in verse four, you see that John summarizes the whole of his message this way. He describes Christ. He says, in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus came, he goes to the cross. It seems that the light had been snuffed out and yet all that was snuffed out was the penalty due to us for our sin because The darkness could not overcome the light. And John chapter 1 verse 9 says this, The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. So here he is, he's coming into the world. The love of God is being expressed because just as God had to speak in creation, And there was light, so if there was going to be a new creation, so if there's going to be rescue from this gloom, God had to speak once again through the perfect revelation of his son. And then the question is, how is it that people respond? Well, again, there are two categories of response here summarized in verse 18. And if you are going to think about how it is that you respond, and if you're going to be persuaded to come to the light, you've got to see what the, what the options are. He says in verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, 
But then secondly, on the other hand, whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. The response has to be either belief or unbelief. There's no other category. Jesus Christ is the dividing line of history. There are ultimately two races of people. There are those who recognize their sin and they place their faith and their trust in the work that God has done. And there are those who flee from it and they love the darkness rather than the light. And so the following verses then go on to flesh this out for us. And we want to look first of all at those who are unbelieving. You'll notice uh, what they're like and then we can see why they do the things that they do. But we see something of their Uh, What characterizes them here in verse 19? First of all, they don't believe and they are condemned already. So if you're not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is not that you will be condemned someday. You are actually right now sitting under the wrath of God. Paul expresses this truth in Ephesians chapter 2 as well. If you are not believing, you are right now, even as we speak, under God's wrath and curse. This is a weighty thing, dear friends. And we see in verse 19 that this is the judgment. And that word for judgment, as a lot of commentators point out, has an interesting root in the Greek. It's a word that sounds like this, crisis, which sounds like what English word? Crisis. Here's the crisis. Here's the great problem. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light. Just like those bats, they want to get away because they're dead in their trespasses and sins and they know their guilt. They know they can't stand before a holy God and they just want to recede into the crevices and they just wish that God would not see them. Sometimes when you're listening to a sermon and the Spirit of God begins to reveal his truth to you in particular ways, and we know that God the Holy Spirit does this, there can be a profound sense of guilt that comes upon a particular person. I've been there and maybe you have been too, where all of a sudden you know that the preacher is talking to you. And you're pretty sure that everybody else in the room knows that the preacher is talking to you. And you sit as still as you possibly can because you figure if you even flinch, everybody's going to know you're somehow under conviction. And that's exactly what is going on. This verse says, if you look at the end of verse 20, it says that a person's works end up being exposed. And in our hearts, it's been placed there by God and no one can escape. There may be some of you who are watching on live stream and you, you hope that nobody else knows, right? You're there behind the camera and you feel safe. Let me tell you, God sees you and you're not safe, but it's good that you're here. We, if we are unbelieving, are in this condemned position because of not believing in the name of God's only son. And these kinds of people, they love the darkness rather than the light. And the question is why? And the answer is there at the end of verse 19, because their works are evil. And everyone who does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. This is why unbelievers so often respond in violent kinds of ways. They want to suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness. They want to turn out the lights. If you've ever had the fun of pulling the prank of going into a room where it's uh, dark and somebody's asleep, you know, you flip on the light, or maybe if you want to be even more cruel, you take a flashlight right up to their eyes while they're sleeping, and then you flip the thing on, and uh, what do they do? Well, they try to kill you, right? Because they love darkness in that particular moment more than they love light, and they certainly don't love you. But this is what God has done by giving his son, Jesus Christ. The light has come on. And the darkness never overcomes it. All people can do is flee like roaches when the light is flipped on. And uh, it's, it's true that people flee, but it's also true that you might find yourself in this particular place right now 
where you feel that sentence of condemnation. And you're not really ready to acknowledge that. But you want to know more. Now, we lost our oldest member here just a week ago, Ann Thompson, 99 years old, and uh, these flowers here are in uh, honor of her life, and we're thankful for God's grace in her life. Uh, But she grew up going to church, being a fairly uh, ordinary American, as she puts it, and uh, she, in the early days of their marriage, saw her husband be transformed by the power of God through the scripture, and uh, she figured she was a good enough person. She was getting to heaven. She didn't really need to go to the extreme measures that he, she quoted John 3.16 or parts of it, that God had so loved her, she realized the truth of his word, that he had given his only son and that all she needed to do was acknowledge her broken condition, her lost state, the guilt of her sin and to cast herself upon Jesus Christ. And she lived from 1959 onward, and you know what? She lives even today to the glory of God because she trusted in God's one and only Son. And that's the difference, dear friends, between condemnation and eternal life. And if he did it in 1959, he can do it in 2022. So if that's where your heart is, like Anne's, peering on from the outside, wondering, Jesus says, you just come. You come to the light. You hear my voice. You read my word. You look at what I've done. You look at me lifted up there upon the tree, and you will have life. And when we look to Jesus, and when we understand who we are, but more significantly who he is, all of a sudden, the light goes from being terrifying to being beautiful. And we are drawn to him. And that's what verse 21 here describes then. It describes the sort of person who loves the light. What is it that they do and why do they do it? Well, they're they're drawn to the light. Whoever does what is true comes to the light because perfect love at this point has cast out all fear. And you recognize that Jesus actually can deal with your sin. See, this is part of the reason we tend to be dishonest is we think that there's nothing that could actually resolve our guilt other than that we would keep it hidden. We would keep it tucked away. We know, of course, if we're honest with ourselves that that will never work. But when we see Jesus for who he is, what we begin to understand is that we can actually take all of the baggage of our sin All of our guilt, everything that Pilgrim had in Pilgrim's Progress, children, as he bore that weight upon his back, he could take it all to the cross and he could know that his shame and his fear and his powerlessness and his sin and his inability, all of those things, he could actually trust it to Jesus because Jesus would take it all away. And this is what Anne experienced, right? She didn't just pray that prayer once and for all, but she wrote in her testimony about how she had to come to believe every day and to see that she could trust her Lord, who is light, to guide her at every step along the way so that she could do her works clearly in the light and that they would be seen that they are uh, uh, done uh, in God. Well, uh, the believer comes to the light. And and how is it that we come to the light? We need to think about this. Well, we look to Jesus by faith, right? That's the essence of believing. But what else is it that we do? We know that the Lord is our light and our salvation, as we have said. So what do we want to do? We want to hear his word. Uh, God's word is a light to our feet. It's a lamp to our path. How is it that we're going to be guided through the whole course of life? Well, we're going to go to the word of God. We're also going to recognize that everything that's good and true and profitable in God's creation is some reflection of his being. And so when we go to school, children, what are we trying to do? We're trying to grow as we learn. Uh, When we come to the truth, it not only builds our faith, but it causes us to grow. Some of you are learning about photosynthesis, or you probably will this year. 
uh, at various grade levels in science. And what happens when the sun shines, which direction do the plants tilt? They move toward the sun because they're taking the nutrients from the sunlight and they're turning them into food for themselves. And this is why the leaves turn green and they prosper. It's because they love the light and they want to grow toward it. And so those of you, whether you're in a university setting or whether you're in a lower grade or whether you're learning new things at, at, uh, at home or at work, as we grow and as we see the light more clearly, we begin to flourish. And so our trust in God doesn't simply resolve our guilt. It causes us to spring up in even fuller ways into eternal life. And we begin to flourish the way that God has designed us to flourish. So we go to God's word and we go to his creation and we we see the truth of who he is as is consistent with his revealed word. And we go to uh, be with his people in church. John would write later in 1 John Chapter 5, verse 7, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. There's a beauty that comes as we walk honestly with one another. We have the freedom to confess our sins to one another and to know that as we do confess our sins to one another, there is uh, the, the knowledge of God's forgiveness that we experience not only directly from him, but we're reassured of this by the people of God. Ray Ortland says this, the most important uh, personal trait in a gospel culture is honesty. And he quotes from John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And he says, in the context, walking in the light is an honest relationship with Jesus and one another so that we're free. So that we're free. So that we have life. We're not encumbered by that guilt but we're able to be transparent with our brothers and sisters. So what does it mean for you to come to the light? Well, it means to come to Jesus Christ. And it means to come to the family of God in public worship. It means to come into fellowship with other people so that your life can be exposed to them and you might experience more of the grace of God. And then we also experience it as uh, we come to the light. It'll be clearly seen that our works have been carried out in God. There's an evangelistic focus here because Jesus is the true light that has come into the world. And what happens then in the hearts of his people? Well, we're kind of like glow sticks or something. You know, we get near the light and the, the light of the Lord Jesus Christ fills us. And when we go forth, it becomes clearly seen that everything we do is done in God. Now, does this mean that the world is going to love us and say, wow, I see the revelation of God uh, to me in you and it's beautiful? No, what are they probably going to do? They're probably going to turn around and run away from you. Or they might attack you. Because when your works are done in God, it puts them on edge. So if you stand in our culture for things like the truth of biblical sexuality and identity, If you stand for life and against the killing of the unborn or the born, others may look at you like you're crazy. If you have seen the light and you know that God has called you to fill the earth and to rule over it and to subdue it, they may see young mothers who are staying at home and giving up their careers and they may scorn you for it. If others of you are giving yourselves in your particular calling to Uh, to to things that just seem worthless in the world's eyes, they may look at you and say, you could probably make a lot more money doing something else. And yet you know that everything you're offering is simply a gift being given back to God. What you can know is this, that though the world may condemn you, your God doesn't. And what does he do? He shines the light of his countenance upon you so that you might know his smile. 
And if you were here for the funeral, you, you heard the testimony of what happened in Anne's life as she was uh, breathing her last. She uh, died a slow death, and it was, uh, it was beautiful to see the Lord with her. She'd been unconscious and basically without expression. And as she took her final breath, she broke into a broad smile. Her eyes didn't open, and she didn't take another single breath. What did she see? We don't know exactly. But what we do know from the scripture is that she, as the child of God, saw the light of God shining upon her, the smile of God and his countenance, ready to receive her into eternal glory. And that is not something you would run from, dear brothers and sisters. When your life is ultimately on the line, what is it that you long for? You long to be received by the loving arms of your God into his presence for all of eternity. So my desire for you today is that you would come to the light. You would see the expansive and the deep and the broad love that the eternal God, the triune God has for people like you. You matter in his eyes. And he has sent his son into the world the true light, so that you might know his gracious love. And let me tell you, the worst thing you could do right now, uncomfortable as you might be, would be to turn and to run away. Rather, join the throng and come to the Savior who gives life. And he doesn't just give it to you in that moment, as we've said, but he will give you his light so that you can do all of your works in God with great confidence and boldness whether in your academic work or your work in the home or your work in the community and in commerce, wherever the Lord puts you, you can know that his light will shine through you even as his face shines upon you. And when that day comes for the Lord to take you home, you will see his smile and you will smile as well in response with great joy and gladness. As he says to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the love that you have shown to us in giving us the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we know that we're people who need to turn to you and that there are those who do and those who don't. And we thank you that you bring that to pass through the proclamation of your glorious word. Lord, we pray that you would not allow people to love darkness more than light. We know that those who love their sin more than they love you, they don't receive your forgiveness. But Lord, we pray that you would give us those kinds of changed hearts where we would just say, I want to jettison all of this so that I might know him. Lord, would you send forth your light and your truth into the hearts and lives of people even this day? And would you encourage us? And would you inspire us and cause us to long to come more and more to the light through all the days of our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing from Psalm 36, Selection B. And uh, you can find it in the book in the pew in front of you. You can also look at it on the screen. But I want to pull it up here so that you see in verses, uh, in stanzas one and two, the relationship here between uh, God's love and uh, the the faith that he works in people's hearts. Uh, The first stanza that we'll sing says, Your love, Lord, reaches up to heaven. Your faithfulness, the skies. Your justice is like mountains great, like depths, your judgments wise. Lord, you preserve both man and beast. How precious, God, your grace. Beneath the shadow of your wings, mankind their trust will place. From all the bounty of your house, they feast till satisfied. From rivers full of your delights, you will their drink provide. Because the flowing spring of life is surely found with you. And in that shining light of yours, we have the light in view. Let's rise and we'll sing Psalm 36, Selection B.
Well, in response to God's word and in the life, in response to the life that he gives, we want to give our thanks. And we do that through the bringing of our thank offerings. And uh, rather than pass a plate, uh, you can give uh, gifts of thanks to the Lord in the box at the back or electronically. And uh, we also offer uh, our gratitude to God in prayer. And so uh, Elder Adam Dorr is going to come lead us in our prayer of thanksgiving this morning. Let's bow our hearts. Lord, we come to you and we are just so thankful for your love for us, Lord, that, uh, that you are this, provide the springs of life that are flowing from you, Lord, that you provide the light. As we've heard in the sermon this morning, how uh, you send your son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to offer the free gift of salvation. And Lord, we uh, you send your son to shine a light, to get to con- that light so powerful that conquers darkness. That, um, that shows the way uh, of salvation. Lord, we are thankful, Lord, that we can come to you and that you will uh, wash our sins away, that you will purge us uh, like with hyssop and that you will uh, make us whiter than snow. And Lord, these are just uh, the gift of salvation, the, the testimony of the gospel, Lord, those are just in- incredible gifts that we just, um, we can never repay. We can, we can only come with an attitude of just of humble thanksgiving, an attitude of worship, just a, a, an awe and reverence for just your, your power, your love, and your mercy, and your grace. And Lord, we are also just so thankful for how uh, the, your faithful servant, Ann Thompson, was a testimony to the power of the gospel, to the power of the renewal. Lord, we're thankful for her story of how um, you... Uh, work through her husband, Ken, to show, to, to, who, who demonstrated a transformed life, a life of, uh, you know, when, he, when he, his eyes were opened, when he saw the light, when he, uh, his heart was transformed, how he changed and how Anne saw that transformation and was drawn towards it. She wasn't repelled toward, toward, away from it, but Lord, she was drawn towards it and she wanted to learn more and she was hungry and Lord, uh, you know, thankful for how then using your scriptures that uh, you, you led, drew her to yourself. And Lord, we thank you that uh, she does not come, not just come to you, but then she was uh, lived a life of faithful devotion to you, a life of service to other people. Um, and Lord, we're just so thankful for the many ways in which you used her to bless this congregation, to bless the members of this congregation. And Lord, how even in, um, you know, just even in death, she was resting in you and uh lord we're just you say that precious in the sight of the lord is the death of your saints and lord ann thompson was certainly very precious and we are we're thankful that now she is free from pain and she is uh delighting in um the glory of your presence and and so lord we just want to give we just are so thankful for her the testimony she gave in this life and the ongoing um blessing that is Lord, we also uh, just want to thank you for uh, Elder David Pulliam. Lord, as he's going on sabbatical, uh, we just want to give thanks for the the service that he has provided this congregation. Lord, how uh, you raised him up as uh, someone who grew up in this congregation, learning about your word, um, and raised him up to be a leader, uh, someone who just uh, poured has poured his heart into so many people in this congregation, has listened to them provided advice, provided a counsel, and has really um, you know, desired to come alongside those who are needy and those who are hurting. And Lord, we're very, we're great, very grateful for that. Uh, Lord, we're also uh, thankful that he has this opportunity to, to pour that, pour his heart into his family, more time to be with Grace and to be with his children. And Lord, we just ask that you would um, really bless that time. Lord, we're also thankful for bringing Zach and Beth safely to South Sudan, uh, working through all the, the logistical difficulties that, that uh, developed in that process. Lord, we thank you for the ministry of the Kush for Christ team and the way they are uh, seeking to grow and strengthen the church that is there. Lord, we thank you for the way the gospel was shining in a place that is really to many of us feels like the ends of the earth and lord people who are just so full of so full of need 
Um, but Lord, ultimately, don't just need, um, you know, physical, uh, have physical needs, but Lord, ultimately, they have deep spiritual needs that can only be filled by you and your son, Jesus Christ. And, and Lord, we thank you for the people that you have raised up to serve there, uh, for their heart, for their passion for sharing the gospel, their passion for strengthening the church, and just uh, ask, Lord, that you would be, you'd be um, blessing that work. And Lord, we're also thankful for just the, the way that you have brought the ends of the earth to our doorstep, Lord, that you, have, you bring uh, students from all over the world to the campus of IUPUI, that you bring uh, immigrants and refugees um, to just a few miles within the church. And Lord, it's an opportunity to, um, to we, we don't even have to go to another country to be fulfilling the Great Commission, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you for that incredible opportunity. And Lord, we thank you for the people that you have raised up in this congregation with a strong passion for ministry to to those people. And Lord, we thank you for the for the ministry to students, the ministry to uh, ESL learners, the ministry to refugees. And um, Lord, we just, we thank you that um, for those opportunities and we thank you for the people who are involved in, in them. And we thank you for this opportunity to share the love of Christ to, um, to people from all over the world, people who may have never had an opportunity, never may never have heard of Christ before, people who um, may never encountered a Christian before. And we're just really, we're just really, um, really grateful for that. Lord, you have just, uh, you have richly blessed us. And Lord, we thankful, thank you that uh, you're a God who, you know, in your, when you bless, you don't just bless a little bit. You don't just bless uh, out of the, uh, out of the remain, the, the, just throwing crumbs, scattering crumbs our way. But Lord, you are a God who just, who delights to bless us richly and fully and out of the uh, out of abundance and uh, so Lord just recognizing that and recognizing your um, grace and mercy we're just come to you in an attitude of just humble thanksgiving and Lord we just pray all these things in your son's name amen well, as Adam just prayed, God doesn't just uh, bless us a little bit, but he blesses us from his fullness, and we see that in his creation. We're going to sing about this in Psalm 104, Selection A, a psalm of thanks in response before the benediction. And uh, Psalm 104 roughly follows the pattern of creation, as you uh, know. And from the outset here, as we'll sing these uh, first eight verses, we say, My soul, bless the Lord. Lord God, you are great. Why? Well, it's because he covers himself with a garment of light. He speaks the word and there was light and God now has in Jesus Christ spoken a new creation into existence and we who are part of that new creation can go forth into God's created world with gladness knowing that as we seek him this week, we're going to see God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven in part, even as we serve our savior waiting for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. So let's rise. We'll sing Psalm 104, selection A, and then remain standing for the benediction and doxology.
Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.